David's going to come read for us now. From Romans chapter 15, verses 14 through 33. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort, as putting you in mind, because of the grace which is given to me of God, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. I have therefore thereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about through Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he has not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. But now having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire in these many years to come unto you, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey, and to be brought on my way thitherward by you. At first I'll be somewhat filled with your company. But now I go to Jerusalem to minister unto the saints, for it pleased them in Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It has pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister on them from carnal things. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may be with you, that with you be refreshed. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Father, well, only by the power of the Spirit of God can men's hearts be open. As we read the scriptures, may the God of peace give us joy and understanding in the word. Be with Ken as he preaches the gospel. Amen. Well, I've entitled this Admonishing and Serving One Another. As we've seen to this point, the body of Christ is not an organization, it's an organism. And so all of the members fitly framed together as the Lord has been pleased to call them to himself, those that Christ redeemed that God has chosen. And you can see here in this closing part of this chapter just how much Paul had a pastor's heart, an under-shepherd's heart. It wasn't just a matter of going from place to place and teaching some doctrine and then moving on, but that even as he says here, in the very first verse of my text, verse 14, I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren. You see how he dealt with these. He wasn't putting himself above them. He was not a dictator, but considered himself to be one of the brethren, just like our Lord Jesus Christ. When he came and identified with that people, that the father gave him. He said, behold, I and the children whom thou hast given me. That's an amazing thing. He's the heir of God, the son of God, and yet he's pleased to count such as we are to be joint heirs with him. And you'll notice there in verse 14, where Paul says that ye also are full of goodness. As I've said to you before, wherever you see that word good, Think of God. You are full of godness. In other words, God has made the difference. That's what separates you apart from those in the world. 
And that's not to be taken lightly, that those that are his are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge. That's not talking about head knowledge, but that's the knowledge of Christ, in whom the very fullness of the treasures of knowledge are, are in him, in the Godhead. And then he says, here it is, able also to admonish one another. This is saying that if those that have sat under the gospel for some time and have heard the gospel of Christ and rejoice in his grace, there's a growing, a maturing. They shouldn't have to wait for the preacher to tell them what to say and how to walk, the way to live. No, if the spirit of Christ is in each one, then they admonish one another. And the word admonish there isn't in the sense of always critically looking at other people and saying, oh, you better be careful. But as it is they exhorting one another in the love of Christ, and that has to do with our fellowship, our communion. That's why we meet together. I love it when after our times of worship here, and I've opened to you the word to hear different ones speaking with one another about what they heard, what the Lord showed them. That should be what occupies our conversation with one another. These are precious times. There's enough time to talk about things out in the world, workplace, politics, and all that stuff out there. This is our time. And therefore, gather together what's our time, but to speak with one another, exhort one another, in the things of Christ. And I'm sure that there's no greater blessing for any of us. You know, we get beat up in this world and it's just good to come to a little oasis like this is here and to be able to hear of Christ and as others speak about things that they're going through and, and uh, enduring affliction. God orders all of our trials and afflictions, but that that be the moment to care for one another. And that's the pastor's heart that I see here in the Apostle Paul. You know, he There was none clearer than him in how he declared the gospel. He determined not to know anything save Jesus Christ and him crucified among you. And there were those that considered him to be a hard man. And that's all he can talk about is Christ and him crucified. In fact, even as we read here, his greatest enemies were those of his flesh, his, his earthly brethren pursuing him from place to place trying to quiet him and, and uh, get him to change. But he determined that as long as the Lord gave him breath, that's what he would do would be to declare Christ and uh, to encourage those that the Lord drew. He wasn't trying to raise up a following to himself, but he was on the trail of God's sheep because that's the mission that the Lord gave him to do. We don't know about the origin of the church in Rome. Different people speculate. Of course, the traditional thing is that somehow it's founded on Peter. Well, there's no indication that Peter ever went to Rome. That's just tradition. We find him in Jerusalem when Paul was sent out to go preach to the nations and uh, at the end, we find him in Jerusalem where the Lord had put him because he was an apostle to the Jews. That's why the Lord kept him there, right there in Israel. But the Lord said that Paul would be an apostle to the Gentiles. Amazing thing because he was a Jew. And logic would say, well, the Lord would be best. To, don't you like when you try to counsel the Lord? He'd be best if he raised up a Gentile that knows him. No, he raised up a Jew, converted him, sent him forth to the Gentiles. But everywhere that he went, that was his message. You, you may wonder, you know, how did the Lord establish this church in Rome in the beginning? Well, if you go back to Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, there were Jews there on the day of Pentecost from Rome that had come and heard the disciples speaking of the glories of Christ and his resurrection and ascension. And guess what? They went back to Rome and met together. The Lord knows those that are his. And even 
this is the amazing thing even about the story of Paul, that he was the great persecutor of the church to begin with. When you read in Acts chapter 8, it was because of his persecution that many of the Jews had to flee and go into the other parts of the world, spread out into the nations. And can you imagine now the very reason why they had to flee in the first place? <laughs> Here comes Paul, preaching Christ, gathering, no longer persecuting them and chasing them and gathering. What an amazing story, testimony. You can see why this is why this was on Paul's heart as he went different places. I'm sure he met people that said, yeah, I, I was there when you were persecuting. But oh, what a blessing now to be able to come sit and hear of this same Christ. That's the work of grace. And that's what Paul wrote about there in the beginning. I know we've taken some time to go through Romans here, but in Romans chapter one, that's what he speaks of there in verse 13. He says, now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oft times I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, in other words, he was hindered hitherto, that I might have some full, some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. And he said, I'm debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. So that to this point, the Lord had not directed his path to Rome. That would take place actually within three years of him writing this to the Romans. But it was going to be in a way that nobody ever imagined. He would be taken there as a prisoner. But the Lord would, when he got to Rome, had to hire a house to wait his hearing before Caesar on his case. He was a Roman citizen, but a Jew. And even in that hired house, the Lord brought people to him to hear of Christ. So wherever the Lord directs, we can see his hand in it. But in this message here in our text in Romans 15, 14 to 33. It's a pretty simple outline to remember. There's sometimes when I'll read through the scriptures and there doesn't seem to be a particular outline. I don't try to force it, so I just go down through the scriptures. But as I read this and prepared, it just popped out at me where Paul is talking about his priority. He's talking about his purpose. He's talking about his plan. And he's talking about his prayer. So that's pretty easy to remember. The P's. Here we have four P's. Priority, purpose, plan, and prayer. What was Paul's priority? That's what we see here beginning in verses 14 to 16. He lays it out when he says, I myself am persuaded of you, my brethren. And then he goes on to say that ye be able also to admonish one another. And then he says in verse 15, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of what the grace that is given to me of God. As you remember what we've been going through here, there was conflict between Jew and Gentile, different ones having different backgrounds and upbringing. And yet Paul boldly sets forth that none of that should be a cause for separation when it comes to the body of Christ. So he's encouraging them here. That's his priority, is to encourage these that the Lord had called out. They weren't Paul's disciples. They're the Lord's. They were his brethren in that they had the same father and the same elder brother. But his purpose in writing them is for their encouragement and their own growth in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. That was always his priority. And I pray the same for myself. It's not to draw attention to myself as if somehow this is Ken's congregation, Ken's church. I've heard people say that and nothing disturbs me more than to hear. No, it's if it's Ken's, we're in trouble. But if it's Christ's church and he has drawn each one, then it's on the sure foundation 
his person and his work. But here Paul's desire was that they, in their maturity and growing, be able to what administer, admonish one another. He didn't write because he felt that he had to be in there dictating everything that they did. There's some preachers that way. It's it's a horrible bondage if you've ever sat under somebody like that. They, you don't move unless they tell you to. And they're always checking you out and always wanting to make sure you're being right, doing right, thinking right. That's as if, you know, who made you Lord? And Paul certainly does not approach these in any way that way, but rather to encourage them in looking to the Lord to admonish one another and to understand that this congregation there in Rome really didn't have a thing to do with him because he wasn't there to begin with. He wasn't the founder. He's writing to them never having met them. Any of these that were in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, Paul wasn't there on that day mingling and, and worshiping with them. He was putting forth plans to go after these that, that gathered in the name of Christ and persecute them, arrest them, stop them. But here he lets them know in verse 15 why it is that he has spoken so boldly with them. It's because of the grace that is given me to me of God. Everything that has to do with God's work is because of his grace, that grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. And any minister of Christ, it's only by his grace that they minister. And so he's careful to remind them of that. But again, his priority here with them is to be a minister of Jesus Christ for them. That word minister that he uses in verse 16 literally is the word servant. Actually, it's the word deacon. I've mentioned that to you before. Church tradition has had it such that, okay, there's deacons and elders, and they say, well, the elders, they're the ones that kind of administer the church, and the deacons, they're the ones that count heads, count money, and deal with the menial things. That's not how the Lord established deacons. Back there in Acts 6, deacons were chosen out, or elders were chosen out, so that the deacons could, what, minister the word. And that's the word he uses here. He was a deacon of the gospel. I'm a deacon of the gospel. We have some elders here that are manning and managing the, the affairs of the church so that I can give myself to preaching the gospel because that's what the Lord has given me to do. So that was his priority, ever in service to the Lord, to the Gentiles. You see how it's put there in verse 16, to the nations. That was the word that the Jews hated. And we get narrowly focused even our own thinking because when I look around this looks like a pretty white group right here but you know what Christ church is not white it's made up of people from every tribe nation and tongue that's been one of the privileges that I've had over the years in going from country to country and preaching the gospel and seeing the Lord bring together people that in no way look like me or are from the same type of background as I am. But when it comes down to the worship of Christ, they love to hear of him. That was my privilege this morning. It's that every Sunday morning, every Friday morning, the morning here, afternoon over there, but to, to worship with people from Africa that it's the same gospel in which they rejoice. And every time, like this morning when I got ready to, to sign off, they said, make sure you tell our brother they're in Shreveport. We love them. And we love the gospel that the Lord's taught us. I wonder how much of any of us even think about any outside our little circle here. 
But the Lord has blessed this congregation beyond measure, not because of me, but because of Christ. And the word's going forth, where? To the Gentiles, to the nations. And Christ is gathering his church. And if it could ever be that many of those, the Lord would bring them to sit here with us. You might look at them because they, they might look different, and talk different, but they're brothers. And that's what Paul is saying here to these, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. And there he uses it again, ministering, not overlording, but ministering to the Gentiles, being the minister of the gospel of God. Notice that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable. Being sanctified or having already been sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Paul is reminding them that when these Gentiles are being brought in, you that are Jews, receive them. See, that's what we've been studying all the way through here. Don't build barriers between you and them because they're already accepted by God in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. That's talking about being set apart by the Holy Spirit to Christ. And therefore, he says that that offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable. When he's talking about the offering up of the Gentiles, he's talking about how even when Christ died, it was for them that Christ was offered up. You say, well, Christ died for me. When he died, you died. That offering up to God was on your behalf. So, you don't look down your nose at these others that also have been offered up by the grace of God. Here in Romans 15 and verse 16, this is language that is filled with images of the priesthood. Paul says that he serves Christ as would be a ministering priest. He's not saying he's the high priest but a ministering priest. And that's what we are. If we're the Lord's, we're priests unto God. He's made of us a kingdom of priests. The priests of old, they serve the high priest. And so do we. Christ is the high priest, but he's made of us. If we're his, then he's redeemed and called a kingdom of priests. And our one priority together, Paul's saying this, not just himself, but the whole priority is that they might, as priests, minister to one another and encourage one another. So his priority has to do with the preaching of the gospel. His priority has to do with the, the strengthening of the saints, of those that Christ has redeemed. But here in verses 17 to 19, his priority is also that the glory and the work belong to God alone because it's only God's work done through him for Christ's sake. That's important to remember. He says, I have therefore, whereof in verse 17, I may glory. Boy, do people like to talk about the Apostle Paul today, but if we could just have another Apostle Paul in our day and they're elevating the man, Paul would never have that. Here he says, I have therefore whereof I may glory, but through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. I'll tell you, that's how you can tell a true servant of Christ. Amidst all the voices today, there are many, their priority isn't Christ. They'll use his name, but it's personal gain. It's wanting to increase their own popularity or whatever. Paul says, no, any priority I have belongs unto the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And he considers that, even though he was mocked and pursued because he was a Jew going out and preaching the gospel to these Gentiles, yet he said that he would not glory save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. You realize every one of his epistles is written to Gentiles, not to the Jews, to the Gentiles. And... Uh, whether in word or deed. That's what he says there in verse 18. I'll not dare to speak 
He watched his words. He was careful in what he said. He wasn't a court jester to try to entertain people. He wasn't a philosopher to try to educate people with whatever wisdom he may have had. He said, I'll dare not to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. He's saying, if I have anything to say, it's going to be only what Christ has wrought. And he says there, in word and deed, and he goes on, verse 19, the Lord blessed his ministry with many signs and wonders, but that's not what he preached. You see, the New Testament had not yet been completed, and the Lord would use Paul to continue to write these epistles that we're reading, even John. John was the last of the disciples. He lived on into the first part of the first century, the last to write the scriptures there in Revelation. He wrote that as the Lord directed him. But their preaching was not of signs and wonders. The Lord used those as a testimony to the truth of the Christ that they proclaimed. But as these scriptures were being written, you read less and less about miracles and signs and wonders. Why? Because it's the word that is vital and not the signs and wonders. And so that's why Paul says there that his one purpose was to preach. He says in verse 19, from Jerusalem and round about unto Eilerichum, which would have been up there in what we know today, believe it or not, as Yugoslavia and Albania. That's where that city was. And then in here he speaks about his desire even to go to Spain. If you look on a map from Jerusalem to Rome, Italy, and then on over to Spain, his desire was that the Lord might continue to use him for the preaching of the gospel. But that was his desire. You can see there in verse 19, under underscore it, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ from Jerusalem that's where the Lord said it should begin, then Samaria, and then what? The uttermost parts of the earth in Acts chapter one and, and verse eight. But that was his priority. Secondly, what was his purpose? What was his purpose in not being in Rome? He'd already expressed his desire to go to Rome and preach for these and encourage them. And yet the Lord himself had not let him Everybody today talking about them letting God do this or that. No, if God doesn't open the way, it'll not be opened. This is God who determines where and when his gospel is preached. And Paul was likely in Corinth at the time that he wrote to the Romans. You can go back and read that in Acts chapter 20. He spent about three months there in Corinth. And from there, he would have written the Romans, but here he, he explains to them in verses 20 and 21, the reason why he was not there yet. He's pretty much saying, had it been up to me, I'd have been there. He hadn't even met these yet, and yet his heart was one with them. But here we see his purpose when in verse 20 he says, yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. We don't know who was the leader or the under shepherd there that was caring for them in Rome, but he could say of Rome that the gospel had already been preached there. But here his desire and purpose was that he should preach where no other man had laid a foundation. In other words, where Christ had not yet been preached. That's why you would never get Paul give him a letter and say, we want you to come be our pastor. He wasn't a man to settle down in one place. He was looking out throughout the world. And it was the Lord that gave him that desire to look at places yet where the gospel had not been preached and knowing the time was, was short to be able to go and preach. So he says, as it is written, 
to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. Paul understood that in this, he was actually fulfilling a portion of scripture that was written in the Old Testament. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 52, Isaiah 52 and verse 15, that's what he's quoting here. And again, they didn't have chapters and verses back then, but he knew the scriptures. And that's why he says, as it is written, but here in Isaiah chapter 52, this is the portion of which he's speaking. Verse 15, so shall he sprinkle many nations. This was forward looking to Christ's work after his death, burial, and resurrection ascension. The spirit would be poured out on all flesh in the sense of sinners from every tribe, nation, and tongue. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. <laughs> Look at the times that Paul testified between the be to the Felixes and uh, others that uh, even in Caesar's household that their mouths were shut at him for that which had not been told them shall they see and that which they had not heard shall they consider. That was a verse of scripture that Paul here describes as his purpose. He wasn't just driven People would look at him and say, you're, you're somewhat of a driven man. You can't settle down anywhere. Well, as long as there was a place for him to go and to preach the gospel, that was his desire. So even here we see his heart is somewhat, might call it a pioneering heart, but it was really a heart that the Lord had given him to go into the nations and to preach the gospel. That was his purpose. His priority was preaching Christ. His purpose was to go where Christ had not yet been preached. And so he explains there in verses 22 and through 24, there were some that of the Corinthians that were upset at him because after he'd left and he told them that he would come back and see him and then the Lord shut the door, they began to say, well, Paul can't keep his word. You know, people want to find fault with a the preacher. They're going to find fault with the preacher. But ultimately, when you hear them criticizing one who's a servant of the Lord, it's because they don't like his message. But none of that moved Paul. He continued to go where the Lord directed him. And so even here, he expresses, though it was his purpose. You see, he had a purpose to go and preach to the nations, but he also had that purpose to come see them. Verse 22, for which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. We see that in the book of Acts. There's some that say, well, God wants everybody to hear. No, there's certain places where he is directed that his gospel not go. You realize there are certain parts of this world yet that they've never heard the gospel and they've died and perished without ever hearing. God's purpose that. He's a God of salvation, but he's also a God of condemnation. And so even here, Paul says, I recognize that even though my purpose is to come and to minister to you a word from the Lord, yet I have been much hindered. He wouldn't say that Satan was hindering him. Satan's not more powerful than, than God, but rather that God is the one who had hindered him. And he says, now having no more place in these parts, he'd pretty much gone around Greece. That's where he was, Macedonia, Corinth, Many places there, Thessalonica, a lot of the gospels that are written are written from that particular area. And uh, he says, having no more place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come unto you. Now in his mind, his purpose was that he would, on his way to Spain, if you look on a map from where he was there, even in Greece, over to Rome, Italy, that wasn't too far, maybe a thousand miles. But then from there, if you look on the map all the way over to Spain, he was thinking on the way to Spain, he would stop in and see them in Rome. You know how we do, we get planning and purposing things, but as we know, the disposing thereof is of the Lord. There's no indication that Paul ever did make it to Spain, at least not in the scriptures. We don't ever read that the Lord took him there. He had a desire 
but he submitted it all to the Lord, as we do, all of us. Our purpose is submitted to what God has purposed, and therein we bow. But his desire was nonetheless to see them, and uh, that after his release from imprisonment in Rome, particularly at the end of Acts, some think that perhaps that was when he did go to Spain, but the scriptures don't tell us that. So we've seen priority. We've seen purpose. Purpose is a determination. And with that, now the third is the plans, Paul's plans. But as we saw in the reading in James, you know, if you say we're going to go here and there, what do we always say? The Lord's will be done. And certainly Paul says that here in verse 25, but now I go unto Jerusalem. There was a plan that he had here that was keeping him from going to Rome, and that would be to go to Jerusalem, he says, to minister unto the saints. For saints there is the ones that God has called, that he's justified in Christ and sanctified, set apart in him. You say, well, what was so important there in Jerusalem, it says, for it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. There was a famine that was going on in Jerusalem. There had been persecution. There were a number of widows, we know from studying the book of Acts that were there as a result. And the Lord had laid it on Paul's heart as he went from place to place to gather means or funds. They didn't have uh, these uh, places where you can just go and send money on a cash app. It had to be carried. And so that's what he was doing. While he was going from place to place and preaching the gospel, particularly there in Greece, and ministering to these Gentiles, here the Lord was turning the tables because the Jews were accustomed to be the, the ones that were always on top. And now they were down here. And Paul's saying to them, what a beautiful opportunity for you now, the Gentiles, to give to the needs of those saints down in Jerusalem that they had never met. And so as Paul went from place to place, again, that was his plan. His plan, as the Lord laid it on his heart, was that these Gentiles to whom he was preaching might in return, for the blessing of hearing the gospel, give to the needs of these Jews. See, God has ways of bringing people together when perhaps they would not even have anything to do with each other. That's his will and that's how he works. And so he gives this reason here in verse 27. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things. He's reminding the Gentiles that you know, Christ was a Jew. He came according to the lineage of David. And he lived, died, and rose again, but it wasn't just to redeem Jewish sinners. It was also to redeem and justify Gentile sinners, that together they might be one. And so now he points back to that as he calls it here a duty. Their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. That word duty in the word, you got what's due. Wouldn't you think it would be your due? Because you've heard this gospel through Jewish teachers. When you think about what we believe today concerning the gospel, it comes from a whole Jewish culture. All of the Old Testament written in Hebrew. In Hebrew. And uh, yet, God purposed that through that there be one united church of the Lord Jesus Christ of both Jew and Gentile. It's not a Jewish kingdom. They have no dibs on, on the kingdom any more than we have as Gentiles. But Paul is saying there that because of the origins of 
the scriptures, and all these things coming from them, would you not think it's your due? That's what the word duty is. To also minister unto them in carnal things. He's talking about bringing gifts and uh, helping in their need. Over in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, a lot of people like to use this portion as referring to some kind of tithe that you set aside at the first of every week, but that's not what it's speaking of here. 1 Corinthians 16, he says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him and that there be no gatherings when I come. He's talking about already having sent ahead and letting them know that when I come, if the Lord so directs your heart to give, because it says there, as the Lord has prospered, then lay aside every time you meet together on the first of the week, lay aside something for the gifts to the saints. What he's saying is I'll come by and collect these and take them with me as I head back to Jerusalem. So Paul's observation there is appropriate in his plan. This is his plan that these Gentile believers who were part of the broader Roman Empire, remember even Israel was under the Roman Empire at the time, but he's out here preaching in the regions beyond, but that they benefiting from him even being a Jew and the Lord sending them all that way to preach that they would in return now, their heart would be to be one with those that were still in Jerusalem and in need. And then verses 30 and, and through 33, to wrap this up, we come to Paul's plea for prayer. Paul himself, we know, was a man of prayer because the Lord so dealt in his heart to pray for those that he went to preach for. But he also asked for their prayer. It says in verse 30, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God what for me. I know there's some that probably don't think they need the prayers of the people, but I do. And I'm thankful whenever people tell me, Ken, I know some of the burdens that you bear in preaching the gospel of Christ. We're praying for you. You couldn't tell me anything more meaningful than that because I know that I need those prayers. And the word that Paul uses there in verse 30, that ye strive together with me, it's really the word agonize together. When our Lord was in the garden before he went to the cross, it's the same Greek word that was used of him, that he was agonizing before his father as he faced the cross, considering what it would be him, the just one, to bear the sin of the unjust. And Paul uses that same term here, that as he went forth to preach the gospel, they would be there upholding him in prayer. When William Carey was first sent out to, to go to India to preach the gospel, that was his desire. He, he told those that were sending him that he was going to India, and he said, I'll go down into the pit, but the church must hold the rope. I like that. They were one with him as he went forth. Not everybody's going to go out and preach the gospel in some of these places. I'd tell about it different places the Lord's directed me over the years. I've heard certain ones say, well, I could never do that. Well, the Lord didn't call you to. And uh, for a, a time and a season, he did me. He put me in those places and circumstances. I look back now and marvel. How the Lord directed all the way. It wasn't me. It was the Lord. And uh, I'm thankful that uh, he's the one that's directed all along. But he says that I may be delivered, verse 31, from them that do not believe in Judea. You can see here his sorrow over even his Jewish brethren, according to the flesh, that continued to oppose him because they were legalizers. 
They didn't like him preaching the free gospel of liberty, just like people don't today. If they get upset, it's because they don't believe this gospel. They prefer to continue to hold to their traditions, rules, and regulations. But he says that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints. In other words, that when he brought these material goods back to those in Jerusalem, that they would receive it with joy and not think, oh, we can't take anything from the hand of Gentiles. But they would receive it as of the Lord. And then he says that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may with you be refreshed. We know from history that he did eventually make it to Rome, but not in the way he had planned, but it was according to how God had purposed it. But he asked their prayers in every way, and that's what we see his desire here. It closes with, now the God of peace be with you all. Amen.